Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to today's webinar. Uh, my name is Alex Durr, and I'm going to be your host today as we talk a bit about transitioning to class three 14ers. Uh, it's an exciting time in the 14er journey when you start thinking about doing uh, a class three peak, but it also comes with a little bit more, you know, risk and um, and there's there's more things to consider when you're you're planning one of these trips. So um, today we're going to kind of walk through that whole process from the very beginning of starting to pick a peak um, that you're going to climb, uh, doing some research on various different things, checking out the route, making sure you have all of the right gear. Uh, and then some actual tips for when you're out in the field, including you know climbing and scrambling tips uh, and emergency preparedness advice. So um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, there is a Q&A function uh, in the, the program. So just post your question uh, and I'll try to uh, answer it throughout the webinar at, a, uh, at the end of each section. And then we'll also have a few minutes at the end for Q&A if you have some questions then as well. To start us off, before we dig in, though, I'd love to just start with a quick poll question. Uh, so you should see a question pop up on your screen now. Um, but the question is uh, simply, what is your 14er experience level? Um, it'll help me, uh, you know, do a better job today and give you the give you the information you need uh, if I have a better idea of where uh, where the room is experience wise. So um, just uh, take a moment to answer the question. And Looks like a bunch of you already are, so we'll give you a few more seconds to do that here, and then we will uh, we'll get started here. All right, we'll give it two more seconds here to to vote on the poll question of what is your experience level. All righty. So the uh, the I guess most common answer in the group is uh, uh, that you've climbed about one to five 14ers, uh, but no no class three peaks. And then that's followed up by having climbed more than 10, uh, but 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 never a class three peak. Um, it does look like a few of you, three of you have, have in fact already climbed a 14er that's class three, so that's great. Um, hopefully this is a good refresher for you and, and matches what you saw in the field. Um, and it, it looks like nobody here has never climbed a 14er, and that's that's good to know. Uh, so you all uh, hopefully have a sort of a, a, a mastering of the, the basics and, and know what to do there. So uh, with that, we're going to jump into the session here today um, on transitioning to class three climbs. Uh, my name uh, here is Alex Durr. I'm going to be your host today. Um, I've got 45 uh, ascents above 13,000 feet, including over a dozen uh, class three and four climbs. Uh, I'm an Eagle Scout and a lifelong hiker, and I've got some certifications, Leave No Trace, uh, and Wilderness First Aid certified. Um, but I think the thing I'm, I'm really most proud about is just the fact that I, I really enjoy helping people explore the outdoors, um, you know, challenge themselves, uh, find new ways to explore the mountains, and probably most importantly, uh, how to do it safely and sustainably, where you're you're not leaving a trace and you're not putting yourself uh, in, in too much or, or unnecessary risk. So for today, we'll be talking a bit about class three climbing a lot. And so I just wanted to start off to get everyone on the same page by sharing a, a definition here clearly of, of what is class three climbing. Um, and this is the, the definition from 14ers.com I, I sort of just took. So it's it's scrambling or unroped climbing uh, where you have to use your hands most of the time to hold the terrain or find your route. And this could be caused by a combination of steepness and extreme terrain, like large rocks or steep snow. So as you can see, uh, class three is a little bit of a nebulous zone. Um, both class three and class four are kind of gray areas in terms of where one begins and where at one, uh, one ends. So uh, it's important to keep that in mind that going out to one class three peak uh, may be very different from going to another one uh, because one might have more exposure and one might have less. One might uh, be worse with snow and one might not. Uh, so there's a lot of variability to keep in mind. Uh, and that's one reason why it's it's important to do a lot more research than you might normally do for a 14er. Uh, so uh, to get into this a little more detail, you know, how is a, a class three different than other peaks? Well, first of all, and probably most significantly, there's usually a lot more exposure. Um, 
specifically enough exposure, and, and by exposure I mean clips or, or drop-offs, um, but enough so that that if you fall there, it, you might be seriously injured or even be killed. So um, this is a big step up from class two, you know, where a fall is almost certainly not fatal, right? Um, if you're climbing up boulders that are pretty much horizontal and you trip and fall, you certainly might bang your head, but you're probably not going to end up in a hospital. Um, class three is a, is a different ball game where if you know you're not watching what you're doing and you trip uh, and you you let go, you actually could be in some serious harm. So uh, it's important to keep that in mind. That's the biggest reason why helmets are necessary for class three peaks. This is the sort of line on 14ers where where you really start uh, to use them regularly. Uh, the good traction is also very important. Um, this is pretty much important for any 14er, but it's especially so here where you're actually going to be uh, uh, you know, balancing on rocks and pushing off them to push upward. And that traction is super important. Um, speaking of which, uh, it's also where simple climbing moves start to come into play. Um, you're not really doing full on climbing on a class three. Um, that's, that's pretty rare, but you are sometimes doing one or two moves uh, that you might classify as climbing. So uh, it's very easy and anyone can do it with the right knowledge, but uh, it's it's more so than what you'd find on a class two peak. And then lastly, route finding is gonna be more difficult because of the nature of the game. You don't have a trail to follow. Uh, it's, it's not a simple marked route uh, in most cases. So um, route finding does become, uh, and navigation becomes more of a challenge on these peaks. So when, when are you ready? When's the right time to try a class three peak? Well, obviously this is super different for everyone. Some people are ready much sooner than others, especially I would say if you have climbing experience, uh, roped climbing. But in general, what I tell people when I really don't know much about their background is, is I tell you to first do at least one class one or class two 14 er And thankfully it sounds like everyone here has done that already. Um, and then one thing I also recommend is, is to go visit a climbing gym. Um, and there's there's a lot in the Denver area and in other cities. Uh, uh, just to, to go take a day trip and sort of see how you react to exposure. You know, when you're up on a wall hanging off a rope, um, it's it's really helpful in my experience to, uh, to know what you're going to do and what you're going to feel there in a controlled environment when you've got a rope before you head out to the mountain. And there's a lot of thin air and elements and there's no rope. So... Um, that that's sort of my my recommendation. Um, and once you've done that and you handled them both well, you're like, I got this. Then it's it's probably a go time for a class three peak. So um, the climbing gym part isn't truly necessary, especially if you've done a lot of of fourteen hours already and you've been near exposed, you know, ledges. That might you know really constitute that for you um, already. So for today's webinar, uh, I've got like six parts here, and don't worry, they're really quick, so we're gonna kind of cruise through. Um, we're gonna cover uh, picking a 14er to climb, uh, research and preparation, the gear and equipment that you need, uh, some simple climbing moves that'll help you move better over the rock, um, some route finding tips, because again, following the trail becomes more difficult, and then lastly, some emergency preparedness tips on, on really what to do if something goes wrong. Uh, and we'll finish with the Q&A session if anyone has any questions I didn't answer throughout the session. So to start, uh, picking a 14er route. Um, there's a lot of things to consider because like I said, these routes vary quite widely. Um, there are really easy climbing routes where uh, class three, the class three really comes from the exposure more so than the actual climbing. And then there's really tough peaks where it's, it's you know, you're doing a lot of climbing moves. Um, there's like, like I said, the difference in exposure, some are very, very exposed and some really don't have much at all. Uh, some of them are 14, 15, 16 miles, some are short of seven. And then some of them go on for, for overnights, uh, honestly, in a best case situation, because there's just so long and there's, there's so much technical scrambling involved, it just makes sense to do it over two days. Um, and then of course, there's, there's others that can just be done in one day. So my recommendation, if you're starting out, is to pick an easier trip uh, that can be done in a day, so you're not having to lug a backpack, you know, full of backpacking gear along. That's that's going to really, you know, tire out. Um, do a day trip with some shorter elevation. I've got a few recommendations here on some options for you based on what kind of experience you're looking for. And just a note, I will be sharing a copy of all these slides at the end of the session, probably uh, tomorrow. I'll be sending out an email with both a recording of this and also a copy of the slide. So 
don't worry too much about trying to take really detailed notes because you'll get a full copy of this tomorrow. So um, starting to look at my recommendations here. The first recommendation is going to be the easiest option I have. Um, and this is Mount Sneffels. It's a wonderful mountain uh, located in the San Juans of Southern Colorado. Uh, and it's a pretty easy class three because it's only got 2,900 feet of elevation gain. And it's only got six miles uh, in terms of, of the distance. Uh, the one sort of big con with Mount Sneffels is that it's a long ways uh, from Denver. You're looking at anywhere from uh, a five to six hour drive. So uh, uh, the benefit of that is that you will not see many crowds on this peak. Uh, you may be, uh, you'll probably have other people, but they won't be many. Uh, it'll be nothing like Quandary Peak or, or Beer Stead or anything in the front range. Next, we have what I think is my best actual overall uh, uh, recommendation for a class three peak, and that's Wetterhorn. Um, a lot of people say this is this is the best thir uh, best fourteener of all of of all categories, uh, simply because it's it's a great location. It's not too busy. There are great wildflower blooms in the summer, um, and it's got really good class three climbing that isn't too dangerous, uh, but but it's really enjoyable. Um, it's a little more difficult than Mount Sneffels at uh, about seven miles distance and thirty three hundred feet. Uh, but it's still one of the easiest class three peaks you can do. Um, again, down in the San Juans, and you'll need a four-wheel drive vehicle to get to the upper trailhead. So that's something to note as well. Long's Peak is what I consider to be sort of the classic class three climb. This was my first class three climb. So it's it's certainly tougher than the first two uh, with about 5,100 feet of gain and 14 and a half miles round trip. Uh, but I like to say that it's worth it because you're doing a, a famous, a really the world famous climb, uh, one of the most popular in the state, uh, and the only one in Rocky Mountain National Park. So there's a lot of lore and, and history when it comes to Long's Peak, and it's it's sort of fun to read up about that as you research and, and be part of that. Lastly, the toughest of, of the beginner 14ers uh, for class three is, in my opinion, Kit Carson Peak, uh, if you take the challenger point approach. So this is gonna be a two peaks in one day trip, and it's also best done, in my opinion, as a backpacking overnight. Uh, you can backpack up to just short of Willow Lake and set up a tent and spend the night. It's one of the be most beautiful uh, uh, alpine lakes in the state, so it's a great place to camp. Uh, and then the next morning, you scramble up the ridge you see here in this photo to hit Challenger Point. And then you'll do some about an hour and a half to two hours of scrambling to make it up Kit Carson Peak. Uh, so it's, it's a long trip. It's 14 and a half miles. And it's got the most gain of any of them at 6,200 feet. But if you're looking for a, a really challenging climb and you really like to backpack, uh, and if you haven't already done Challenger, then this might be a nice option. Uh, just keep in mind that it's tough. So, so take your time and, and give yourself plenty of time uh, by starting off early enough. So once you've picked the peak that you want to climb, it's time to do your research. And research on a class three peak is going to be a bit more involved than it normally would. Um, it's, it's really just quite more important, frankly. Uh, most of these routes don't have an established trail and they don't have any official markings. Uh, the only class three peak that has any kind of official trail markers is Long's Peak. And that's because it's in the, the national park. And so they uh, maintain it because they just know it's so popular. Uh, they have big spray painted bullseyes that mark the route, but that's it. On most peaks, you'll have nothing. Uh, there will be um, some rock piles called carns that you may come across, but realistically, a lot of them aren't trustworthy. Uh, it's hard to know whether or not uh, a carn is uh, official or whether it's, you know, some some random person just put it there and it's not actually marking the true route. So never trust a carn unless you know you're on route for sure. There's also going to be way less people to follow. And so that's probably, you know, a lot of people show up to a 14er and they've never even looked at the map. And they just figure they'll kind of just start on the trail and follow the person in front of them. You just can't do that on a class three peak because there may be no one else out there. Uh, and if they are, they may be doing a different route or variation than you. So definitely don't just follow people. My personal sort of uh, system for, for preparing is to first read the complete route guide for the route that I want to do uh, and review the map and, and also look at the route photos that shows what the rock looks like. Um, and then I jump on YouTube and I try uh, to find a video that someone's posted of them climbing it uh, because this 
helps a lot put things into perspective and, and also just get their advice. And then the last thing I'll do is I jump on 14ers.com uh, and look up recent trip reports for that route specifically. These are really in-depth narrative style reports that really, again, help give you the little details about the route, maybe information about uh, spots where you can skip harder sp uh, you know, parts of rock or uh, little, little other strategies that, that you might have otherwise missed. The last big part of the research is going to be focused on weather. Um, most class three routes are pretty committing, which means once you start on them, there's not uh, an easy way to get back below tree line uh, without going all the way back you came. Uh, so if you get caught in a lightning storm, uh, you may have no option but to just keep scrambling through it until you get down. Um, this essentially just means you have to leave yourself a bigger margin for error. So if, for example, there is a forecasted storm at you know, 6 or 7 p.m., you might want to just assume it's going to come three hours early and try to be down by 2 or 3 p.m. Because if you really try to push that up, uh, to the line, you know, that's not going to be a fun experience climbing along a ridge with lightning striking around you. The other big thing to keep in mind too, besides doing your regular typical weather forecast uh, research, uh, is just that wet rock is slippery and it makes climbing a lot more difficult. So do be mindful of, of rain or snow that may have happened the night before you plan to climb, uh, because that can really complicate things, especially on a more difficult route. All right, before I move on, somebody asked, uh, where does the sawtooth ridge fall? Um, I'm assuming, and, and correct me if I'm wrong in the chat, I'm assuming you're asking about the Mount Bierstadt sawtooth ridge. Um, this is a, a pretty, I would say it's right in the middle of those of those climbs. Uh, first, uh, the sort of tough thing is you have to climb up Mount Bierstadt uh, via the normal route. So that's already, you're looking at, you know, a seven mile, um, seven to eight mile hike. Um, and then you've got to do this, this additional class three traverse. Um, so by the time you end up getting down, it's going to be more like, you know, a, a 10, 11 mile, uh, maybe 12 mile day. Uh, but that's notably shorter still than Long's Peak uh, and also shorter than uh, 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 Kit Carson. So I would say it's, it's middle of the pack. It's, it's definitely a longer day, much longer day than Bierstadt. I would recommend starting pre-dawn so that you uh, have time and, and you're not up on the ridge when lightning strikes in the afternoon, but you don't have to do it as, a, as an overnight for sure. And it's definitely doable. I did it as I think my second class three climb. So that would definitely also be a good option for a beginner peak uh, because there's a, probably a lot of, of people or a lot more people there to help get directions and move around too, if you're new. All right, we're gonna keep going. Uh, feel free to ask questions in the chat if you like. Um, now we're going to talk about gear and equipment for a class three peak. So the, the most obvious piece of gear you need for a class three mountain is a helmet. And this is ironically, uh, it, 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 people always, I think, assume that a helmet is there for you if you fall, you know, because, you know, we've all banged our head on a rock, I think at least once and it sucks and it hurts. Um, and we can imagine if we really fell and started tumbling down the mountain, you know, it'd be so good to have a helmet on. But that's not at all the reason. Um, it, most people who fall, the helmet is not going to be enough to protect you. The helmet is really there for falling items uh, that are going to fall onto you. So uh, that's why it's important to use an actual climbing helmet that was designed as such, rather than trying to just make your bike helmet work or your skateboard helmet. Uh, those helmets are built more for side impacts because if you fall, the way you fall, again, you're going to hit the side of your head. You don't fall directly onto the top of your head. So they have padding in exactly the wrong places. So it is important to get a true climbing helmet. Even if you kind of bulk at the price, it's worth the 70 or 80 bucks you're going to pay. It could save your life. Um, this is essentially why you should wear a helmet anytime you are below other climbers on a class three route. Um, essentially, if they're up above you directly and you think, yep, they could definitely accidentally knock some rocks loose and they come tumbling towards me, it's time to put your helmet on. Um, some people say they wait until other people around them are wearing them, but that's that's not the right strategy. Uh, definitely make the judgment yourself and and do it as soon as you think that a rock could come down. I'm just going to pause to answer the question. Uh, somebody asked, "What weather apps do you like?" They use Mountain Forecast and Open Summit, but they vary a lot about wind speed. Yeah, great question. So both of those two apps, Open Summit and Mountain Forecast, they differ primarily because they both 
use weather models uh, to sort of forecast or predict what happens. Um, my personal favorite is actually the, it's not an app, it's just the website, but it's the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration website. They have a, a pretty cool map click function and you can just Google NOAA map click and it'll come up. But essentially it's just a map. You can you know, search for the mountain that you're looking for um, and click the, the peak and get a pretty accurate forecast for that specific spot. Um, it's, it's more detailed in terms of hourly uh, you know, hourly details than some of the other apps out there. And in my experience, it's, it's been more accurate. Um, that said, I always say to take all weather forecasts with a grain of salt because they're, they're correct about a third of the time. They're somewhat correct a third of the time and they're totally and completely wrong a third of the time. So, you know, even if it says it's going to be blue skies and sunny, you want to sort of assume that it's going to be, you know, uh, gray skies, thunderstorms, and 10 degrees. So um, just uh, an asterisk on that. All right, so moving back to gear. Uh, we talked about a climbing helmet. Um, the next up is going to be good hiking shoes or boots. Uh, people ask me if they need to go out and get climbing shoes for a class three peak, and, and no, you realistically don't. Um, it's probably a bad idea because if you stub your toe or something, climbing shoes don't have really any protection. So hiking boots are a better choice. Um, some people do like to use approach shoes. Um, these are shoes essentially designed for climbers to wear uh, for hiking up to a rock wall. If they've got to hike a mile or two to get to the rock wall, you use approach shoes for the approach. Um, they are they have more sturdy grip uh, and traction than a lot of hiking shoes, and so that's why some people like them. But ultimately, it's your choice uh, because I, I do think hiking boots are good for for approach hikes where you might trip and, and that ankle support is helpful. So I use hiking boots, but any any good pair that has really solid traction to help you know grip the rock is, is what you're looking for. Now class three peaks are the point where the risk goes up and and so I do recommend using satellite GPS unit, SOS device or some other personal locator beacon. Uh, they're expensive. Um, I get that too. I asked for mine for for a birthday present from concerned family who I knew had a, a vested interest in me using one, um, but they're worth it. Um, one, just to keep family and friends aware of, of what's going on your trip, but also they're great GPS tools. And of course, if something really bad happens, uh, these devices can call for help really fast, uh, even if you're outside of cell phone range. So uh, it's it's not necessary by any means, but I really do recommend getting one if you plan to do you know more than a handful of these because Odds are, eventually, you, you may need it. Uh, on the topic of shoes, someone asked about trail runners. Um, what I would say is I've seen people do class three peaks in trail runners for sure. Uh, for sure. Uh, I have, uh, I've been there. Um, I probably wouldn't recommend them purely because uh, of the traction game. Um, they're, they're made for light, you know, light speed, speed and, and, um, really speed over anything and, and being lightweight. And, and that means they make some sacrifices when it comes to, you know, traction. So um, typically I think a hiking boot or an approach shoe is probably going to have the best grip. But if you do have a really, really high end, you know, pair of trail runners, um, they might have the traction you're looking for. So I would just recommend taking whatever you want to wear and, and finding some rock outcroppings and, you know, trying to just sort of climb up and scramble up them and hang off them and see how the shoes work. Uh, because you'll know pretty quickly, you know, I tried that with some, some bad hiking boots uh, and I knew immediately that they weren't going to cut it. So that's a good way to sort of test out the shoes. Just go out, find some rocks, hang off of them and, and see how firm they are and holding you in place. All right, so we talked about boots. We talked about personal locator beacons. And lastly, uh, gloves. People ask me if they should wear gloves. And again, this is a, a personal preference ring. The biggest issue is that rocks can be kind of sharp and gritty, especially on some peaks in particular. Uh, so a glove is going to protect your hand, keep it safe, prevent cuts, scrapes, uh, any, anything like that. The sort of downside of a, of a glove is that it just inherently has less grip than your hand, your bare hand wear. Uh, there's more space to, for, for, you know, cloth to slip around. Uh, and so if you do get a, a, a glove, it's pretty important to, to have a really nice tight fit and not have something that's really big uh, and loose and hangs off. Um, some, something that is 
It's sort of like, you know, um, you wouldn't wear a hiking boot that was two sizes too big, and you probably shouldn't wear gloves that are two sizes too big either. So um, definitely get something snug and fit if you are going to use the gloves. Um, they're also, I will say, really popular in the spring and the fall season because these rocks will be pretty, pretty like cold when you, you get started. Um, if you're out there in the dark and pre-dawn or right around dawn, they won't warm up, you know, until the, the mid or late morning. So gloves can also uh, just really help keep you comfortable there. All right, part four is really going to be focusing here on now actual scrambling and climbing. This is something you really don't do on class one and class two peaks. There are a few rare examples where there might be sort of a class two plus move, uh, but essentially class two means you're only using your hands for balance. You're you're moving mostly horizontally. It's essentially a trail made of, of rock, and you're just sort of using your hands to, to, to move over the rocks, right? That's class two. Um, class three here, we actually start moving not just horizontally, but up the rocks as well. And that's where the, uh, the climbing aspect gets involved. So I have a few tips here. Um, the best way, I will, I will preface this before I, I get into this, the best way to learn to climb is to go and climb. And by that, I mean, go to a climbing gym and get a day pass, uh, take a, a 30 minute beginner's course if they have it, and just get onto a rock wall because there's something I really think ingrained in humans when it comes to climbing. You know, I, I think we spent our first years in in uh, in Africa climbing trees and climbing cliffs a lot. And so when you get into a climbing gym and you get onto a wall, something really does happen, uh, and you really start to it's it's sort of like riding a bike. You really start to learn intuitively how to look for holds, how to reach for them gra and grab for them and hold them and rest. Uh, so before I do these clip trip tips, I'll just say, if you can get into a gym for even a day, because it'll make a big difference before you're up on the mountain in thin air with weather conditions and, and just other things to consider. So my climbing tips based on my experience as a climber, uh, both class three and class four and class five, uh, is first of all, to remember that your feet should be doing the lifting. <clears throat> A lot of people jump onto a, a rock wall and they start pulling themselves up with their hands and their arms one after another. Uh, and this is a really good way to tire yourself out really fast. Your legs are way stronger muscles than your arms. And, and so it's simply more efficient to use them. So your, your hands really should just be gripping the wall to hold you in place and also to balance you when you're moving around on your feet. Your feet really should be sort of stepping up the rock and do the bulk of lifting you up and over it. Hands are just there to hold you in place, keep you tight and safe and snug, uh, and keep you balanced. One tip that uh, one of my early climbing instructors gave me uh, was uh, to go to, and, and try to really climb quiet. And what we mean by this is, if you watched a, a beginner climber before, when they're trying to find a foothold, they kind of flail their foot around and slide it against the wall, kind of looking for the hold. Uh, and it's kind of clumsy and loud, and it's it's frankly it wasteful of energy because every time you kick it around looking, you're you're wasting energy. So climbing with quiet feet means essentially just taking your time, maybe looking down and looking where you want to place your foot, and and placing it there in one clean movement, rather than kicking your foot around and dragging it around and trying to find it sort of blindly. Um, that is going to be a, a way to 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 save energy. Uh, it's a little lower risk because you 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 have a lower chance of you know kicking your your toes on the wall, uh, and also frankly it looks cooler if people are watching. So I highly recommend it. Uh, lastly, this is a, a great time to get in the habit right off the bat of testing all of your handholds and footholds. Uh, these being just the spot in the rock that you're going to grab onto, uh, because there are some fourteeners later on, uh, mostly uh, in the the Maroon Bells area that have very loose, rotten rock that is kind of famous for, for looking firm, but breaking away when you put weight on it. So I think it's a great sort of skill to just build into your routine to always have a habit of before you ever put all of your weight on a hold, before you sort of like, you know, grab onto it with your arms, just hold onto the hold and give, you give it a firm shake and maybe put a good, maybe a third to a half of your weight onto it, just to make sure that it's totally firm before you go for it. And you can do this in half a second or one second, just a quick moment before you put all your weight, you just put a little bit on, make sure it's good, and then pull through. So uh, 
Um, it's not really necessary on peaks where where the rock is very firm, but it could save your life, you know, on a on a loose rock mountain. Uh, and so it's, in my opinion, just easier to just make a habit of it, so you never forget to do it. Next, uh, some other tips here that aren't really climbing specific, but they're helpful for these moments where you're just like this gentleman. You're you're sort of exposed, uh, you know, hanging over a ledge, um, pushing yourself up a, up a mountain. Um, First, breathe and take your time. Um, you've got all the time in the world to make it up the mountain. So don't push yourself, don't rush yourself, uh, unless of course you've got a lightning storm coming after you. People tend to, to speed up when they're um, you know, getting into these sections and, and it's important to remember you don't need to. Um, positive self-talk goes a long way. You're gonna be exhausted because scrambling at 13,000 feet is a lot more tiring than doing it at, at you know one mile high here in Denver even. So I like to pick a mantra, uh, sort of a little phrase that I tell myself over and over, like you get to do this or uh, just you can do this. Um, the, the summit is just there. Um, but whatever you want it to be, pick a mantra. And in, in those moments when you're really suffering and struggling, just repeat that mantra to yourself a few times. Uh, and it, it almost always helps me kind of push through and get to the next spot. Uh, last point is to be watchful for opportunity to bypass more difficult sections. Um, it's difficult route finding up here, uh, and we'll go through that in the next section. Uh, and so it might be easy to miss that, you know, you went up a, an unnecessary class three pillar when there was actually a little trail segment that went right around it. So always take a moment, you know, when you get to a new viewpoint to look around and, and make sure that you didn't miss something. Now let's say you want to do a class three peak and you hate exposure and you hate heights. You, you, you hate the idea of being this guy suspended from a cliff face, uh, you know, hanging there. Um, what do you do? Um, I won't lie, it's not easy to climb a class three peak if you are afraid of heights. So it's best to try to handle the situation before you end up out there. Um, again, I recommend first heading out to a climbing gym and spending some time on the wall because you will be on a rope, you'll be totally safe, you can even get an instructor to help you and, and we'll kind of work through it that way. Um, but it's the safest way to handle this. Uh, once you're ready and you think you can uh, get outside, it's it's best to even take that outdoors so you get a more realistic environment to what it'll, it'll be like when you're climbing uh, you know, a 14er. I also recommend sort of progressing from, from hikes that don't have any exposure uh, to picking some 14ers based on uh, what you can find about the routes online that have some limited exposure. Um, some examples of that would be Blanca Peak, which has a little bit of exposure near the summit. Um, also, Castle Peak has some exposure along the way uh, and uh, and a few others. So I would try some of those class two peaks with exposure to see what it's like moving just along a cliff. Uh, that'll help you prepare a lot and try to get over that that fear. All right, moving into section five, uh, focused on navigation and route finding on the rock. The, the key thing to keep in mind here is that that class three peaks typically don't have a marked route. And so if you don't know where you're going, you honestly, <laughs> you're not going to find your way down the mountain. Um, so it's, it's very important, like I said, to take time to research the route in advance. Um, I recommend looking at the map, looking at those photos, looking at trail reports uh, and trip reports, uh, and even videos to really get a full sense and almost intuitively understand the area. Uh, once once you're, you're on your climb, you're going to get to the point where the trail ends. There, there will be a trail usually for the approach. Uh, and then subtly going to putter out at the beginning of the climbing section. At this point, uh, there are two big sort of things that can screw you up pretty easily. One is that there's often going to be a lot of social trails. These are unofficial trails that just pop up as people sort of don't know what they're doing and decide to just start hiking, you know, towards the route in a certain direction. And over time, these trails get sort of reaffirmed and established as more people hike them until they, you can't even tell which one is the real one. So be mindful of social trails and, and don't accidentally follow one of them. The other big thing that's gonna screw you up are cairns, these little rock piles I told you about that are kind of frustratingly everywhere. They pop up along the trail built by a lot of people Hold on one sec. So cans are annoying because they pop up 
along the, the uh, trail and you don't really know who built them. So they may be official, they may be unofficial. My, my advice is to just not trust Cairns, just assume that they're fake, uh, unless you have a photo that showed you to like look for a specific Cairn. Some of the routes, uh, you know, they actually refer to specific Cairns for navigation. So that's really the only time to trust one. Otherwise, I would use the map, use your GPS, uh, and use the route photos. One big thing to keep in mind is simply the fact that uh, most accidents on Class 3 mountains don't, don't actually happen on Class 3 terrain. Uh, the biggest problem is when people lose the route and wander into Class 4 and Class 5 terrain on accident. Uh, it's it's pretty easy to do when you're on a mountain and everything is just rock. You know, if you look at this photo on 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 here, it might not be obvious that you know they're on a section of class three uh, rock. This is on Kelso Ridge by Torrey's Peak, uh, but on just to the left of them is a is a section of class four rock. You know, and they're only four feet apart. Uh, if you if you didn't kind of look to the right, you may not see that easier section and assume that you have to go up and over that that sort of sheer face right here. So uh, it's important to, to really think about the route very closely as you move to ensure you're actually on it. Uh, if, you're, if you're off it, your chance of an injury uh, or accident goes way up. Um, my recommendation is really just to stop regularly, kind of build it into your brake cycle that you stop, pull out your map, pull out your GPS, compare that to where you, you, know, where you should be, and really just make sure you're on track. Um, it's, it's easy to wander off without even knowing it. And so if you, wait, if, you, if you wait to stop until you actually think you're lost, you're gonna be really lost. I recommend being sort of preemptive about it and just checking periodically. Of course, if you don't know where you are at any time, if you, you've, got, you've gone on a, a section and you're like, none of these rocks look familiar, none of the photos look like this, don't just keep going and assume it's gonna get better. Uh, that's like a, a recipe for disaster. Um, pause as soon as you can safely do so. And again, pull out the route photos, pull out the map, which you should of course have with you and, and make sure you are where you think you are. One last big note to keep in mind. Uh, this is a, a photo by the way here from the sawtooth, um, one of the ledges that you have to navigate. But just keep in mind that there are no shortcuts on class three mountains. Um, I like to say that if there was a shorter and safer way to get from point A to point B, that would just be the route, you know? The route wouldn't be where it was. Um, so if you see a, a gully that you think you could sneak down and get to the trailhead more quickly, uh, don't. Lots of people have gotten into to serious accidents, uh, and it's one of the most common ways that accidents happen on a class three peak. So uh, definitely just always keep in mind, if you see a shortcut, Yes, it is too good to be true because they don't exist on these on these mountains. All right, our last section here today is going to be focused on emergency preparedness. Uh, what to do when something goes wrong on a class three peak. Now, the first thing to to do is to avoid <laughs> an emergency in the first place with a little prevention. And the best way to, to do that and to be prepared is to bring the 10 essentials. I recommend bringing these on all all 14ers of any difficulty level, but they're especially important on a class three peak where it's pretty actually feasible to get stuck out there uh, on, for an unplanned night if you if you get lost or, or uh, get injured. So just as a, a reminder, these 10 essentials are first navigation gear, like a map and compass and, and route photos. The more is better on, on a class three peak. Extra food, uh, extra water, and extra layers. These are all essentially in case you get stuck outside. Uh, that's gonna be pretty important for sustaining you and, and preventing it from being a miserable experience. Emergency shelter is huge. I would recommend bringing uh, in a, a emergency blanket or a emergency bivy that you can buy at most gear shops like REI. You'll also want gear to start a fire, something like a lighter, matches, some lint, or, or small bits of wood. This will help you stay warm if you get stuck outside. Uh, first aid kit and sun protection, like sunscreen, uh, sunglasses, pretty important up in the mountains. And then a, a knife or, or multi-tool and a headlamp for, of course, just you know basic, basic duties when you're trying to survive in the mountains overnight. Keep these with you at all times during the climb. Uh, a lot of people will take it off for the final 
personal section and and leave it and stash it so their backpack just to save weight but this is the the most important part of the climb right where it's it's most dangerous you're at the highest elevation and so you probably need that with you right so keep it with you when you're planning your trip you should always plan as if you know that there's going to be a problem uh so really be t detailed when you leave your notes with someone at home always pick someone dependable who you know will actually watch the clock and follow through and call for help if it is necessary. It's a smart idea to give them as much details as you can about what you are wearing, what you have, where you're going, and when you uh, plan to be there. Uh, because this makes the search and rescue team's job a lot easier of trying to figure out where they should start their search. These peaks are huge, right? So there's a, a a certain time essence involved where if you can get them more information it makes a big difference in the long run and then lastly if someone is really freaking out and, and thinking about calling for help they're probably going to be frazzled and, and panicky so i recommend making it as easy for them as possible and even look up the sheriff phone number for the county of the 14 year you're in uh, the sheriff is the one who handles search and rescue operations so you can call 911 but it's even quicker to just call the sheriff line directly. So if you can, if you remember to, just Google that before you leave and, and jot it down on a piece of paper and, and leave it uh, you know, at the top of your itinerary as the number to call if they need help. If you have the time before your climb, it's a really great idea to try to acclimate and avoid, the, the, to minimize, I should say, the risk of altitude sickness. There's no way to entirely be 100% sure you won't get it. Uh, but on a class three peak, again, where these routes can be very committing, and you might be up on a class three ridge for several hours or for two two miles or so, um, it sucks to get altitude sickness up there. And no, even if you wanted to descend, it's going to take you one or two or three hours. So you might be able to get by without it for an easier peak. It's it's pretty pretty much, in my opinion, necessary for these, these uh, tougher ones. The sort of standard course of action is to take one to two nights uh, overnight to acclimate somewhere around 8,500 to 10,500 feet. This is an altitude that's high enough to actually let you, you know, your blood change and, and for your body to acclimate, but it's not too high that most people won't get serious altitude sickness at this level. If you already know that you're prone to altitude sickness based on the other 14ers you've been on, um, you may consider talking to your doctor about Diamox. Uh, it's a drug that essentially speeds up your breathing, uh, which gets more oxygen and thus reduces your chance of altitude sickness. So uh, it is prescription based. So you'll have to talk to your doctor uh, if, if you want to try that. If you do get a mild altitude sickness, which essentially is headache, nausea, some fatigue, very mild confusion. Um, usually you can treat this with just over-the-counter painkillers like ibuprofen or Tylenol or something like that. Uh, but that's essentially it. If your altitude sickness becomes at all moderate to severe, which means if you're vomiting, um, if you're confused at least moderately at all, um, if you're extremely uh, uh, in pain from a headache, or if you're having some of those symptoms in combination, um, it's time to descend. Uh, the issue here is that if you keep going up, the symptoms are only going to get worse and worse, and you might actually suddenly become, you know, unable to walk or, or fall unconscious and, and not be able to get yourself down. So don't push yourself. Um, go with a group because it makes it easier to make these decisions and, and, and you know, catch it if someone starts to, uh, to be confused and stops making sense. One last note, um, I have this guy here uh, with his canned oxygen bottle, but this is a bad idea. You've seen probably these canned oxygen bottles in stores. Um, there's simply not enough oxygen in them to make a, uh, a difference, frankly, on a 14 or so. Go ahead, skip the bottle. You're likely to just end up littering with it um, and it's extra weight. So I recommend the old fashioned way of acclimation uh, and just knowing the symptoms to watch for. That's gonna be a better bet for you. Now let's say that you've taken all the right precautions and something still goes wrong um, you know somebody falls and trips and hurts their ankle um, you fall or you lose the route and you just don't know how to get back on route um, what do you do first of all stop um, that sounds simple right but a lot of people want to keep moving there's like a primal instinct to keep on the move when something's going wrong 
Uh, so force yourself to stay put uh, and take time to calm down and truly assess what's happening. Um, the big question is really to determine whether you need assistance to make it down back to the trailhead or not. Um, and this might not be a simple question, uh, right? I mean, for one thing, you're going to be panicked most likely, uh, and you're going to not be thinking straight. Uh, some people may be injured. Some people might be missing. So it might take a little bit of time for you to just gather the facts of what's happening. Uh, you know, has someone actually broken their leg? Or after 10 minutes, does it kind of stop hurting and it's, it seems like it's just a slight sprain? These, these things matter when you're making the call. If you can't make it out, though, go ahead and make the decision to call search and rescue. Um, it's, it's better to do it sooner than later. And, and one thing I tell people is if you really are torn, uh, go ahead and make the call because in most cases, the 911 dispatcher can help you determine if you actually are in need of help or not. Um, almost always, they would prefer that you call and they walk you through it and, and walk you back to the trailhead or talk you back versus you not calling and the situation getting worse and then them actually having to go out after you. So um, if, if you need to make the call and, and they can talk through things with you. Speaking of which, we're going to talk about how to do that, uh, how to call for help. This may actually happen on a, on a class three peak. Um, it's pretty rare on class one and class two peaks for most people, but the risk is higher here. So uh, there's a few things to know. First, of course, uh, is getting a signal. You can use your phone, uh, or I recommend using one of those satellite messengers because they have a much better range in the mountains. If you don't have a signal on either of those, I re recommend trying to get higher if it is safe to do so. Uh, just go to a nearby ridge within sight uh, to try to get a better signal. If you are still unable to do so, uh, you can try sending a text with your phone uh, to 911. You can actually text them, uh, and that's easier to get out than a phone call. Now, once you have your signal, most people rush into the phone call, but it's actually a good idea to take a couple of minutes and really practice what you want to tell them because there's a lot of things you could say. You're probably, again, panicked, rushed, uh, and you might not tell them the key details before you're disconnected. So. Take time, think through the five W's of who, what, where, when, and why about your situation. Uh, it'll give the rescuers pretty much everything they need to know to get to you uh, if the phone call's disconnected for some reason, uh, most likely weather or the signal or the battery. Lastly, after your call, this is huge, make sure you stay in one place. Uh, um, this causes lots of problems if you move uh, and, and start hiking for miles. It was actually a recent situation in Arizona where, where unfortunately someone called search and rescue, the, the phone went out on them, uh, and then he continued to keep hiking in the opposite direction he should have been. And so they didn't end up finding him for four or five days uh, because, because he you know, had sort of moved away from the last known position. So always stay put and only move if, you, if, if it's essentially a life or death situation. You know, if you're in an avalanche chute, um, if there's literally a wildfire coming at you, those are pretty much the, the only kind of situations where you need to move. All right, I'm very impressed. I actually timed this out. Uh, that is the bulk of the session here. We've got about 10 more minutes though. So if anybody has any questions about any of that uh, or anything else class 3, 14 or related, uh, now's your chance to post it in the Q&A section here in the chat. Uh, and one person just commented that they're SAR um, and uh, that this is great advice uh, and that no, most people don't know that the sheriff initiates search and rescue and that rescues are not fast. That's a really great point uh, that rescues do take time and that uh, it's important to remember that, that that time also differs depending on where you are in the state. If you're in the San Luis Valley, uh, you know, the, the search and rescue team there is very spread out because there's a rural area. So it could take them literally six to eight hours just for them to sort of gather, not even to start hiking out to the trip, the, the peak. So rescues there routinely take a day or two, uh, you know, whereas in Summit County, they may be able to get to a bit quicker. So keep that in mind when you're, you're deciding on how much risk to take, uh, because it does make a difference. Good call. Uh, somebody asked, uh, Michael asked, is there a best guide or map source? Is 14ers.com good enough? Uh, yes. In in my experience, 14ers.com is pretty good. They have the the route map for each uh, class three route uh, that shows, you know, it's got topographical details. Uh, but I actually, my recommendation is to actually buy a paper National Geographic map. There's a map set online. I think it's, you know, on Amazon 
for like 15, 20 bucks. Um, but it has a full, you know, big page of each of the 14ers. Um, and it's, it's, you can get up close, you can bring it with you more easily. Um, it's got more features, uh, and things mapped onto there than the 14ers.com map does. Uh, and it's, it's pretty nice cause it's like water resistant and tear proof. So I've had them for probably 30 peaks now and, and still they're in good shape. So that's my go-to for a map is, is just, the, it's sort of the old fashioned paper copy. Um, but they, they're great. Um, the other thing I recommend is the uh, Jerry Roach guidebook. Again, it's it's old fashioned, but I just find that uh, they they have done it the best so far compared to online sources. Um, that's Jerry Roach's 14ers guidebook, um, and it has very again full page in depth maps of a lot of these routes. So uh, those are my favorite of all. 14ers.com will work, uh, and you can also go on a uh, uh, shoot. What's the website? Um, I think it's uh, Summit Post. They also have some good GPX uh, map depositories that you can use to sort of plan out your trip as well. Somebody asked, uh, do most use a phone for GPS? Uh, what do I use? Um, I use the Garmin InReach Navigator, uh, which is, uh, it's a comp, it's actually the one that you saw in the photo in the slide uh, today. Uh, it's a combination uh, personal locator beacon with a, like an SOS button. Uh, it's also a GPS unit that is a, a map that you can look at. Uh, and then it's also a satellite messenger. So I can chat and text with people uh, as long as I have a satellite connection. So it's a pretty versatile tool. Um, some people buy a separate spot device and a separate personal locator beacon and a separate messenger. I think it's simplest to just buy them all together. Um, it's about $300, so it's definitely an investment, but it's worth it. Um, for a phone, if you don't want to buy a big GPS unit, uh, the Gaia app is my top recommendation. Uh, All Trails, in my experience, doesn't give very complete information, and their maps are sometimes wrong. So I would never personally rely on All Trails for a Class 3 Peak because it's really more of a hiking app, and, and Class 3 Peaks are not hiking. They're just a different beast. So um, Gaia, but um, really this is where some of these, these more classic mountaineering sources, like the books uh, really uh, and paper maps, do come in handy. Great questions. Any other questions here today? Well, I'll give everyone uh, one or two more minutes in case there are. But in case there aren't, uh, before people go, I just want to say thank you for coming. Uh, you know, y'all are what make these webinars great and worth doing. Uh, and I'm really only able to put on these free webinars uh, because I have some amazing supporters um, who who help. Um, it's not uh, a free, uh, you know, webinar service. And of course, the web uh, site itself costs money to host. Um, and it takes time to do it all. So I do have uh, about 60 people who donate both one time or regularly uh, to support these webinars, these trainings and, and help keep them free. So if you did learn something new, and, and you would like to see more of these resources in the future, um, do visit the next summit.org. Uh, there's a, a button right at the, the menu at the top of supporting the site. Uh, and you can become either a regular supporter, uh, you it's a, a, a nice little perk, you get some exclusive content and articles that I write. Um, or just give a one time gift of, of $5 even it makes a huge difference. And it helps us, you know, keep putting on this, uh, this program. Somebody just asked, can I send a link to that map set? Yeah, if you give me one moment here, uh, I will actually just share the link in the uh, uh, chat here itself. I just got to make sure I find the right one for you. Uh, yes, here it is. All right. Oops. There we go. So this is going to be a link to... Here we go. So this is going to be a link to the, the Amazon Colorado 14ers map pack. Um, it's two separate map packets. One is for the northern 14ers and one is for the southern 14ers. Um, but like I said, they're my favorite. I bring them with me every time, um, and they've, they've lasted a long time. Michael uh, asked me, do I wear bright clothing in case of search and rescue? I try to observe LNT, but a recent Facebook post said to try to wear bright colors. Yes, absolutely. I think I actually saw the same Facebook post that you saw because uh, I thought about adding it uh, to this session and I forgot. That is a great point. Yes. Uh, typically, 
in leave no trace settings, the guideline is to try to blend in with the settings, you know, by wearing greens and browns. Uh, but that rule kind of changes on 14ers where risk level is higher. So um, yeah, definitely good ideas to wear neon colors. Um, it's one reason actually why if you've looked at ski wear, a lot of it is neon. Um, you know, it's for rescue operations in the backcountry. So if you can find something bright green, bright yellow, bright red, um, those are all good options. Um, it's not the best time to try to be hidden. Um, in some stories where people have been gone and missing for a long time, uh, that's sort of a common denominator that they were wearing very dull, earth, earthy colors that, you know, you couldn't see them from a helicopter. So really great, great last point. All right, well, if there are any other questions, you can always reach me personally at alexder at thenextsummit.org. And I'm posting that right there in the message board as well. So if you have any other questions, uh, you think of something down the road, um, just shoot me a, a, an email and I'm happy to uh, to chat with you and, and share whatever advice I have. Um, otherwise though, it's been a, a pleasure spending the last hour with you. Uh, and I just wanna thank everyone for joining us. Uh, it's been a great session and I hope this helps you safely you know, tackle your next, or your hopefully your first class three, 14 or so. Thanks everyone, have a great rest of your day. And again, if you, if you are able to give back in any way, uh, we really would appreciate it moving forward. So. Thanks and have a great rest of your night. Uh, safe travels on the trails from the next summit. Thanks, everybody.